five, four, three, two, one. Committee on Community Development, Tuesday, the 10th of January, 2023. Council Member Galamba. Here. Council Member Rivera. Council Member Bowman. Present. Council Member Nolkowski. Present. Council Member Wyatt. Here. And we're going to uh, have a motion to have all uh, three of the nine members become members of community development today um, uh, for the sake uh, of quorum, seconded uh, uh, by Mr. Rivera, seconded um, by Mr. Wyatt. Quorum is present. Okay. Motion is to open the public hearing. Um, I think that we have city representatives here that want to speak on this item. Um, once the city representatives are done, we will go, um, I believe, to Mr. Carr and his representatives, and then we will have uh, the public speak, but uh, seconded by Mr. Nolkowski. Item number one. Set public hearing for 110 and 118 South Park Avenue. Good afternoon, honorable body. My name is Kavet Chambers, Corporation Counsel for the City of Buffalo. The purpose of our hearing today is to hear from the public and to provide details as, these, as the council considers the proposed action of taking by eminent domain 110 and 118 South Park, South Park. The purpose that we will outline that is going to show the history of what these parcels have done in our historic cobblestone district. We have with us today, uh, Commissioner Kathy Amder, and Director of Development for the Office of Strategic Planning, Lisa Hicks. 110 South Park is currently owned by Daryl Carr. He acquired this property pursuant to a deed that was recorded October 23rd, 2009. 118 South Park is currently owned by Park Avenue Estates, LLC, and Daryl Carr, which they acquired by, I'm sorry, by Daryl Carr, which he also acquired an interest in on December 16th, 2019. We have with us Kathy Amder, and we also have representatives from the Department of Permits and Inspection Services that will outline the history of the attempts that the city has made to get cooperation from Mr. Carr in eliminating the blight that has continued with these properties on, um, in our historic district. Those attempts have failed. We have also sought uh, cooperation from Mr. Carr prior to today, and it's, we're going up on about a year now, where the city did seek prior to even considering eminent domain that we would look to acquire the properties because we understand that eminent domain is a um, harsh result for many but it is oftentimes a result that is exercised by government when we have to eliminate blight, when we have to make sure that our areas that are suffering from underdevelopment because of lack of cooperation from the property owners, that we can move those objectives forward. So we will hear from our uh, commissioner right now as she speaks on the efforts from Department of Permits and Inspection Services. Good afternoon, honorable body. I'm Kathy Amder, Commissioner of Permit and Inspection Services for the city. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today about this important matter. I'm here to explain the conditions at 110 and 118 South Park that constitute a blight. 110 and 118 South Park, uh, it's a collection of six buildings that are all connected. And uh, they're in the Cobblestone District, adjacent to the Key Bank Center, and close to Canal Side, this thriving entertainment district filled with bars and restaurants, filled with pedestrians and tourists who may be seeing Buffalo for the first time on a daily basis. 
the permit uh, permit and inspection services, we enforce, among other things, property maintenance code and codes associated with keeping buildings weather tight and in good repair. At 110 and 118 South Park, there's numerous violations. And I, I have some photos later on, but briefly, those include uh, the fact that they're vacant and there's evidence of trespassing. They're, they're noticeably vacant. There's loose bricks everywhere, deteriorated masonry, cracked cornices, broken windows and doors, missing windows, graffiti, partial collapses of the building, which you'll see in the photos I have later. Uh, chipping and peeling paint, frequently the areas covered in trash and debris. These violations and the general lack of maintenance lead to water infiltration. And that is critical because that's what deteriorates buildings, especially in these historic masonry structures. It's water infiltration that causes them to crumble. And that deterioration is happening at an alarming rate. All of these violations are preventable. We work with building owners every day. We issue an order to remedy where we identify the violations on a property. We communicate and, and always try to work on voluntary compliance. And when that doesn't work, we use other enforcement mechanisms, tickets and fines, and eventually housing court. These buildings have been in housing court for almost 14 years, since 2008, and there has been no significant effort to stabilize or maintain them. The owner's pathway, I believe, and most would agree, is demolition by neglect, something we see all over the country. And when someone can't do what they want, they wait and let the building crumble until they can. We're out of enforcement. Uh, techniques here. We're out of our mechanisms, and these blighted conditions are worsening. So uh, I ask if Mr. Montour, if you could please uh, pull up some of the photos. The first photo just highlights the area we're talking about. And you can see the key bank center there. You can see canal side. We're in the heart of uh, an entertainment district, a thriving entertainment district in our city. And on the, uh, you know, southeast of the Key Bank Center is the collection of buildings. The next photo will zoom in. Here you see the collection of, of six buildings, um, five of which are 110 South Park and a single building that is 118 South Park. Uh, the next photo, please. Here we're standing on South Park looking north and beyond the building to the left is a courtyard. Later in the photos, that area will be focused on because it is the worst of the deterioration and a sign of where these buildings will go if we don't act in a strong manner. Next, please. This is the Illinois facade closest to South Park. Next, please. The central portion of the Illinois facade and notice that one story portion, the roof of that is two photos from now. This is the uh, portion of the Illinois facade closest to ironworks. And here we see the roof of that one story portion that is collapsed and uh, severely, severely deteriorated. This is the north facade. The South Park facade. This is 118 South Park. And uh, here on the upper photo, this is, uh, this is a courtyard area. So if you could note the chimney and smokestack and the, the corner just under the, the chimney to the right, we're gonna focus on that corner for the next six photos because I, I'd like you to see the future if we continue what has not been working. 
Next photo, please. That first photo was from 2009. This photo is from 2015. You can see the masonry has deteriorated significantly. This photo is from May of 2019, not that long ago. Next photo, please. Here we have January of 22. So this is a year ago. And the plywood barrier was put in place to protect that collapsing area at the corner. Over the next few photos, we're going to see that corner deteriorate to where it, it is today. Uh, so this is one year ago. The next photo flashes nine months forward to September of 22. You can see there's been a significant failure in the masonry. Next photo flashes forward four months to December of 22, end of December, so just a couple weeks ago. And the final photo is from yesterday. So it is easy to see the lack of maintenance and the decay and disrepair that are evident in those photos. And like I said, it's accelerating at an exponential rate. We have uh, neighbors who are already suffering. There's an access way between uh, 110 South Park and the buildings to the east that has had to be blocked off to protect the public. And folks are, their deliveries are affected. Uh, you know, perhaps people won't want to rent office space there soon. Like I said, all of our enforcement mechanisms are exhausted and the owner has shown that he is unwilling to maintain his buildings. We as a city need to act with a strong response to an owner who is subjecting the city and the neighborhood to blighted conditions. And we need to do it before the whole neighborhood deteriorates along with this decay. Thank you. Is there anybody else from the city uh, OSP? Six. Good afternoon, uh, Lisa Hicks, uh, Director of Development in the Mayor's Office of Strategic Planning. And speaking on behalf of OSP, uh, we strongly support pursuing acquisition of 110 and 118 South Park through eminent domain to avoid the loss of a critical economic development opportunity and to preserve the historic character of the building and the entire cobblestone district. The city must take action to protect the safety of its residents, uh, to preserve its historic assets, and to sustain and enhance the district's economic viability. Acquisition of 110 and 118 South Park will protect the property from further deterioration and enable redevelopment. The buildings are in the heart of Buffalo's historic cobblestone district, an area well known for its collection of buildings associated with the city's commercial and industrial heritage. 110 South Park was originally built in 1852 as a bakery, and 118 South Park was originally built in 1869 as the Brown and McCutcheon Brass Foundry. The city has made uh, numerous attempts to prompt the owner to stabilize and make repair repairs to the structures, these attempts spanning several years. The lack of repairs and continuing blight will negatively impact neighboring property owners with declining property values. And while we've seen over $2 billion in investment in the city central bus business district since 2012, this blighted and underutilized building further deters private investment. The property's location in close proximity to key tourist destinations like Canal Side, Key Bank Center, the Lee Com Harbor Center, Seneca One Tower, and the DLNW Terminal, as well as the Seneca Casino, creates the potential for it to become a major economic asset in this district if redeveloped into a mix of uses like housing, retail, or office. And the property will attract jobs both during construction and post-construction. 
there are several resources that have been put in place to incentivize the revitalization of historic and blighted properties from various federal, state, county, and municipal sources, but have not been utilized to date for this property. As an example, federal and state historic tax credits, ECIDA adaptive reuse program incentives, the 485A tax incentive, and many other potential resources that could aid in the redevelopment of this property. And looking at the map in the information packages, you'll note that there have been several significant developments since 2012, not only in the Central Business District, but also in the Cobblestone District, specifically Labatt Brewhouse, Buffalo Ironworks, 95 Perry, and the Harbor Center. So again, the city must take action to enhance the district's economic viability by pursuing eminent domain for 110 and 118 South Park. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Wyatt. Sure, thank you. Um, can you, Ms. Amdur, can you be a little bit more specific about what you mean? You said that the city has exhausted every means to address this. I mean, how many tickets have been written? Can, we, can you be a little bit more specific? Sure. Uh, thank you, Councilman. So typically what we do is we start off with an order to remedy. And we are open to discussions, to sitting down with folks. We've had many dozens of discussions over the years, meetings on site, trying to work with uh, the, the owner on these properties. We have written, uh, I don't have an exact number, but many tickets over the years. And courts, housing court is intended to be sort of the, the last stop for the most uh, egregious circumstances. And, and that's where we went with this. So to be in housing court for a case for well over a decade is shocking. And there has not been a substantial movement. We don't foresee that we will have substantial movement based on the past uh, under, you know, in this particular circumstance. So we, we ask for a different alternative and uh, for your support in that different alternative to end this problem. I mean, as far as fines and fees, do you have a number as far as how much? I do not, Councilman, but I'd be happy to get that for you. Okay, if you could. Absolutely. Uh, and and and, I, and I'm not trying to slow up anything. I think that to hear that a property in this type of disrepair has been in housing court for 10 years, more than 10 years, speaks to a real issue, a bigger issue that we probably need to address as far as housing court. Um, how do we allow something to go this long? without being addressed more expeditiously. So again, thank you for the information. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, is there anybody else from the city side? Okay, Mr. Carr or your representatives, uh, uh, you're welcome to come and take the uh, mic, please, and just state your name for the record. Uh, good evening, council members. My name is Daryl Carr, and I'm the owner of a property located at 110 South Park Avenue and with Park Avenue Estates, joint owner of the property located at 118 South Park. As you know, these properties are both located in the Cobblestone District, an area of the city which I've long supported and expended significant efforts to develop. I first bought property in Cobblestone District almost 25 years ago. I still own the property at 130 South Park Avenue, which is located next to the two parcels at issue in this proceeding. It is now known as the Cobblestone Bar and Grill and is one of the longest running businesses in the district. The city is well aware of my long personal and financial involvement in the Cobblestone District, and more importantly, my ongoing efforts and commitment to continue the development of our properties with a signature project that will dramatically continue the renewal of this area of the city. In light of that knowledge, the city's announcement to intend to inquire our South Park Avenue properties to transfer them to some other identified competing developer for an unspecified development, thereby destroying my proposed project is as outrageous as it is ironic. And I have some photos here. I was told earlier today that the audiovisual system wasn't working today. So 
we had a presentation. And uh, so I have some photos of the project, which I am going to leave with the council, and I'm going to leave the statement also. So if you'd like to take those, please, thank you. And also, I have a website you can go to. It's one goal unity or unitytower.com if you want to look at specifics of the project. Thank you. Sorry, I had to, we should have got those mounted. <clears throat> I have made the development and, and rehabilitation of the Cobblestone District the focus of my professional life and career. The next and most significant stage of these efforts is the development of the Unity Tower project, which will be a 55 story tower containing approximately 500 residences and hybrid suites, restaurants, shops, and a rooftop winter garden, all overlooking Lake Erie in the city of Buffalo. Consistent with the stated goals of New York State and Western New York region of the city, the tower would be entirely powered by renewable energy technologies. The Unity Tower project will dramatically transform the Cobblestone District while remaining true to its historic district character and to a degree that could not be achieved by others. The Unity Tower itself will be situated on our two properties at 110 and 118 South Park Avenue and attached to a multifunction complex called Cobblestone Place. The restaurant that I previously mentioned, Cobblestone Bar and Grill, would make up part of the Cobblestone Place. Its brick and mortar construction would be maintained and utilized in the greater complex in order to be consistent with and preserve the historic nature of the Cobblestone District. Our properties at 110 and 118 South Park are obviously integral to the Unity Tower project and the city's proposed acquisition of these properties will destroy the Unity Tower project. In furtherance of this project, I have long sought to demolish the buildings existing on 110 and 118 South Park Avenue parcels because of their age and condition and such that they cannot be developed. They are simply falling down. Despite agreeing that all these buildings are deteriorate, deteriorated and hazardous to the public, the city has continuously opposed these efforts in court. While the Cobblestone District has been designated as historic, some of its structures are unfortunately beyond repair and the city itself has demolished several of them. Unlike the building on the adjoining parcel containing cobblestone bar and grill, which remains in good condition, the buildings at 110 and 118 South Park Avenue, which the city proposes to take by eminent domain, have been determined by multiple experts to be beyond repair, stabilization, or rehabilitation. One of these experts is here with me today. The power to seize an owner's private property over the owner's strenuous objection is one of the most extraordinary governmental powers held by a municipality. Accordingly, both at constitutional and statutory levels, the law imposes a variety of very specific limitations and requirements on the city's exercise of this power. On behalf of the owners of the properties located at 110 and 118 South Park Avenue, I object to the proposed taking as being beyond the city's lawful powers in violation of Article 2 of the Eminent Domain Procedure Law, the State Environmental Quality Review Act, and the New York State and United States Constitution. Let me give you some background. Before proceeding to our specific objections and presentation of the Unity Tower project, I would like to provide some brief background information regarding the nature of the properties and my ongoing efforts to redevelop them. As you are aware, both 110 South Park and 118 South Park are adjacent properties located in the Cobblestone District near the intersection of Illinois Street and South Park Avenue. 110 South Park Avenue contains brick and mortar structures which were constructed in 1852. 118 South Park contains a single brick and mortar structure, a single brick and mortar structure, which was constructed in 1869. The buildings on these properties have historically been used for multiple purposes, including a blacksmith shop, bakery, machine shop, and most notably, a foundry. The buildings contained active furnaces and kilns for these uses. 
according to the experts, is likely that the fires necessary to these operations contributed significantly, significantly to the current state of these structures, which again are beyond repair. Accordingly, I've sought court order in permitting me to demolish them. Approximately 10 years ago, a city court judge granted my request and ordered the demolition of the properties, finding that they were a danger to the public health. The city opposed that order, appealed it, and was overturned on procedural grounds. I have since renewed my request to demolish the properties and a decision from the city court judge, Patrick M. Carney is currently pending. In support of my application, I have provided the city multiple reports from experts who have concluded that the property cannot be repaired or rehabilitated and must be demolished. In reaching that conclusion, both experts cited failed foundations, compromised wood framing, the inability of existing materials to, ex to withstand water intrusion and freeze cycles and, poss and possible environmental contamination. Again, one of those experts is here with me today. Contrary to some representation, representations from the city's officials and representatives, I have in fact taken a number of steps to try to rehabilitate and stabilize these buildings, including constructing new roofs and other structural repairs. The expert who, who inspected the property in both 2010 and 2021 noted these repairs. He also found that while these repairs had allowed the buildings to temporarily outlive their useful lives, they cannot be effectively rehabilitated and must be demolished. While I've tried to do this and proceed with development of the Unity Tower project, the city has delayed the project by continuing to oppose my request for order of demolition. The city now seeks to take my properties and hand them to, again, an unknown competing developer for unspecified development. Objections. Objection one, procedural defects in the city process. Upon information and belief, the city has failed to comply with the procedural requirements of Article 2 of the EDPL, which respect to the noticing and conducting of the present public hearing. Objection two, the city's public purpose is illusory, vague, and unnecessary. The city's purported public use is illusory, vague, and unnecessary. The city's stated purpose is illusory to the extent it seeks to preserve what cannot be preserved. The city states that it plans to take my properties for purpose of relieving blight, answering the community's needs and promoting economic progress in historical district. It is clear from the city's multi-year opposition to my demolition of the buildings on my property that it seeks to preserve the properties and hand the property to a competing developer. That is also clear from the public statements made by the city's representatives to the Buffalo News and other media outlets. But multiple experts has determ have determined that the buildings cannot be preserved and must be taken down. Those reports have been provided to the city. The city's purported purpose is therefore illusory because it seeks to preserve structures which have outlived their useful life and cannot be preserved. The city's stated purpose is also vague. It states that it plans to take my property to answer the needs of the community, but provides nothing further as to what it needs or how taking my property and handing it to an unknown competing developer for an unspecified project will answer those needs. The city's stated purpose is also unnecessary. The city purports to take my property for purposes of removing blight and promoting economic progress to the Cobblestone District, while simultaneously impeding the development of a signature project, which would remove blight and promote economic progress. Whatever the plans the city has to achieve those goals, it will not be more effective than what I plan. The city's claim that these buildings are blighted is contradicted by its own strenuous op opposition to my efforts to take them down. If the city wanted to promote economic progress in the Cobblestone District, Nothing will do that more effectively than a Unity Tower project. The Unity Tower and Cobblestone Complex will provide commercial space for
for restaurants, shops, and other businesses. It'll also provide the type of residential space that attracts professionals. A project of this scope and design and completely powered by renewable energy technologies will even serve as an attraction for tourists and other visitors. Its impact upon the Cobblestone District will be dramatic and unprecedented. The city's intent to take South Park Avenue properties for the purported purposes of removing blight and to promote economic progress is unnecessary fiction. Objection three, the city has failed to comply with secret. I have examined all the documents that the city has issued with respect to its plan to take my property. I've examined what the city has on its website as well. It is not clear from any of the statements the city has put out to whether any sort of environmental review has taken place here and any steps have been taken for what they are. For that reason, upon information and belief, I further object on the basis that the city has not complied with the New York State Environmental Quality Review Act in connection which is proposed taking of my properties. Conclusion, I therefore object for all these reasons in behalf of each of the owners of these properties, the city proposed acquisition of 110 and 118 South Park Avenue by eminent domain. I would now like to, permitting the councils affords me a few more minutes, give a brief, brief presentation on the Unity Tower project with my colleagues here. Finally, to be clear, I submit this statement on behalf of the owners of these properties, and we intend to fight this condemnation. To that end, we have also retained experienced eminent domain counsel in connection with these proceedings. And final, I would just like to be, uh, the hearing to be left open. And I believe I was told till Monday, I would be able to submit any other materials for your consideration. Um, I think actually till Tuesday, is that correct? It would be Tuesday because uh, Monday is Martin Luther King Day. So you would have okay. until Tuesday of next week. Um, I don't think that this would be the proper place to actually go into your uh, uh, proposal for the uh, uh, for that property. Um, I think that would be something that should be put in front of the planning board and not the council. Um, is that um, law department? Uh, Opinion. Assistant Corporation Council Melissa Sanchez. I would agree with that council member. Okay, um, but if you have anything more specifically about the property as is, um, you you or any of your associates are more than welcome to come down and speak. Mr. Chair. Yeah, Mr. Chair. And at this point, also, you would have three minutes uh, to speak. Yes. Be council before member. we have somebody speak, I just got a couple of questions um, for the city. Did the city object to the demolition of this property by the develop by the owner? Thank you, Councilman. So uh, I looked through the files to have the most current and accurate information before we came here. There was a demo application started on uh, April 28th of this year for both 110 and 118 South Park. This is uh, a structure in a historic preservation district in the cobblestone district therefore that needs preservation approval so the procedure is to uh, make application with the department of permit and inspection services and then we refer that uh, applicant to uh, file with the preservation board and that step was never made so we have a procedure to follow and um, the procedure was not followed only application was made no uh, fees at all were paid and no follow through was ever made. So, so this, so no, you had nothing before that that request. The permit, uh, permit and inspection services did not in the court proceedings. Uh, you know that is a matter for the court. There were uh, ongoing discussions in court, but in terms of the city's department, this is the only application I have, and it was not. Um, the follow up was never. Um, okay. So my Done. question for the law department is, is there, do you have documentation that there was something in court or proceeding taking place for demolition? Uh, yes, and we did oppose it because he did not follow the proper procedure. Um, this is not the first time that Mr. Carr has 
um, attempted to circumvent the city's process. As we know that the historic designation that was put in place in 2014 um, of the cobblestone district was done to prevent further demolition of parcels in that area. So instead of actually following the procedure that Mr. Carr is well aware of, he would instead attempt to circumvent, not come to the city and go to court to seek the relief there. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, sir, just state your name for the record and then you have three minutes. Certainly, my name is Daniel Heward of Human Building Solutions. I am a, a mechanical engineer, architect, urban planner, uh, I'm the only lead fellow who graduated from SUNY at Buffalo. Uh, I'm the only uh, well faculty member from SUNY at Buffalo. Um, I serve in uh, in a capacity. Uh, I started in 2009 with the U.S. federal government, helping them guide their federal guiding principles for high performance and sustainable buildings. Um, the last landmark project ever to be built at Hoover Dam I was project executive on the Hoover Dam Spillway House Event Center. Um, I built Supreme Courts as a project executive, Las Vegas Springs Preserve. Uh, I reported to the legislature in Nevada while building the Nevada State Museum, well-versed on historic properties, uh, historic preservation. And I'd like to really uh, remind the council that this is not a historic property. It's It was recognized as a historic dis uh, district. That building has no... Uh, historic relevance, yet uh, the developers, Mr. Carr and, and the fellow developers, were going to honor the district as well as the buildings that are on site with uh, what's in the future, which I won't elaborate on because that's a, a, a different thing. I actually did an assessment of the property in 2010 in support of demolition. I did another assessment of the property in 2021 in August 2nd, wrote a report. The um, Right down to the technical terms, the building doesn't have a conventional foundation. It's got like uh, like railway ties or other blocks that are not contiguous. So the building is settling at an indifferential rate in, in block by block. Um, the walls are not reinforced. They're undulating, falling apart. The bricks used in it were never intended to last 75 years, but have surprisingly lasted as long as they have. I warned Mr. Carr and anybody who read the report that it was dangerous to be within the vicinity of the building because at any point in time, it could fall down. I warned people it was unsafe to enter the building at any time. I advocated for the demolition of the building since 2010, only to see egregious obstruction to that happen here in the, in the city of Buffalo, where I actually worked on three degrees and I'm really disappointed. So the foundations have failed. The structural members, if you look at them and read my report, have failed. The fenestrations failed. The bricks themselves have failed. There is nothing of substance left, and it's not possible to restore that, which was the big push up until summer of 2021. So the, you know, the fact that we see a procedural breach on the part of Mr. Carr um, should not overlay the fact that public safety should come first and foremost. I see my time is up. I appreciate the audience. Um, this isn't demolition by neglect. It's neglect on the part of council to allow a demolition uh, permit to be awarded so that this blight can be taken out and not taken away from Mr. Carr. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. I appreciate the opportunity respectfully, I very do. Okay, thank you. So for our next speakers, I will announce the next three. We have microphones to my left, to my right. Every speaker will have three minutes. Um, if you wanna have any written comments filed with the council after this, you can uh, contact us at councilstaff at buffalony.gov. Okay, Jim, uh, before we go, uh, Councilmember Nolkowski. Yes, do, uh, does anybody else from Mr. Carr's team, are they gonna be speaking or is it now just open to the public? Yeah, let, I'm sorry. Yeah, let uh, the remainder of the team speak and then it will be open to the public. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to be brief. Um, prepare the presentation, but I think you're right. It's for the planning department. Uh, my name is Joseph, Joseph Lowe, L-O-H Architects. I work with Stanford Downey 
He's the arch associate architect, joint venture architect, as well as Fatantic Architecture. So we're the architects on the project. And as I listen to the planning department, I'm sympathetic because in 2015, when Darrow approached us and said, this is what the condition of the buildings are, this is what he wants to do with it and ask us to help him look to the future, what it could be in the future. So if you look at our renderings that we have circulated, we are rebuilding it. If you look at the corner of cobblestone, we are restructuring the brick in the character of what it had been. But also we looked at the planning department's documents and reports and studies, and we do understand that we have to look towards the future in terms of what it could be, in terms of investment into Cobblestone District. And we went back, looked at the building and tried to figure out what we can do with it, even if we're gonna restore the, the, the heritage part, how do we make the structure work? How do we make the floors line up? How do we actually make use of the building, whether it's for a, a commercial amenity, whether it's for loft offices, whether it's for residential. We looked at the planning recommendations for the future of this waterfront district and what we could build. And we propose residential, residential uh, uh, private condominiums. We also proposed uh, a mixed use at the base, the entire base for the entire 200 feet. It's a very small site. And then we also propose the hotel that stacks on top that are owned by, by the condominium, but they're condominium hotel. And then we looked at what we could do at the base, coffee shops, amenities, we uh, bars and restaurants, and we want to build a tourist attraction because it's a sports and their entertainment district. The hockey games are there, the baseball games are there, the football games are there. It's a very active area and a very large scale. We got hotels across the street. So we're looking for investment to this, to build this to the future, to bring in tourism. We want to create a, a panoramic at the top of the building that you can see Niagara Falls and a winter garden with a panoramic restaurant that would attract tourists. So that's kind of the vision. So to cap off this discussion, this presentation, and all the things that were said about the building, how to restore it, we want to create a vision for the future. Hey, thank you. I think there was somebody else from your team or was that? No, okay. Uh, Mr. Mantra, now we will open it up for Mr. discussion um, from residents, neighbors, et cetera. Um, there will be the three minute timeline. So if you could please focus uh, under the three minutes, uh, but we'll start with Mr. Nowakowski first. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to thank my colleagues for their attendance on this public hearing on eminent domain of the structures located at 110 and 118 South Park. To state on the record to this council, I ask that you trust my dedication, my scrutiny and resolve to this long-standing blight on the cobblestone district that I represent. I strongly convey that this course of action is exceptionally rare, being utilized only in unique circumstances. This is purely a case of demolition by neglect. His testimony, Mr. Cars, is a farce. It's a charade that has been played out in the courts for over a decade. Quite frankly, I'm sick and tired of it. For over years, we have experts that state in 2010 that the building was in an immediate danger. Yet alone 12 years, well, now 13 after the new year, we stand and the eminent eminency of this emergency has not come. I'd like to state that this was in, uh, that was in high school when I was in high school. Now I'm a seated member of the Buffalo Common Council. That's how long this has been uh, going on for. It's been stated that these are not historical structures, that they have no historic re relevance. I'd like to debate to who. These structures are some of the most significant buildings in the Cobblestone Historic District. This pre-Civil War era commercial building was built in 1852 and was first home 
to George Mudridge and Son Steam Bakery. The company made hardtack, a type of biscuit for the Union Army during the Civil War. These structures were later adapted for manufacturing during the, during the early 20th century. And I know they will have a future to be redeveloped and readapted and go back to be contributing structures to the Cobblestone Historic District. But Mr. Carr, the owner, has refused to maintain these buildings, let alone develop them for well over a decade. He is in attendance at the hearing at the public hearing today, and I'm still astonished by his utter lack of self-awareness of being an unscrupulous slumlord, disrespecting all of us here in this chamber, in the city of Buffalo, and the neighbors of the Cobblestone Historic District. Today, he, will, he has showed us 50 pictures of a 55 tower he proclaims he can develop if he is allowed to demolish these structures. This is nothing more than an absolute farce. It's insulting that he comes here to these chambers to think that he can lie and deceive the public by showing us a few sketches and rendering a link to a website of a skyscraper that is completely ignores planning, zoning, and preservation standards, nor shown any financial feasibility or professional experience to develop a structure of this magnitude. Mr. Carr can barely show up for housing court or secure the premises. Now he's going to show us plans to build a skyscraper? Stop the madness, stop the stupidity. The owner, Daryl Carr, acquired these structures in 2009 with the full understanding where these buildings were and the level and awareness of where these structures were and that they were subject to preservation laws or preservation historic districts, standards, and scrutiny. Many surrounding establishments, such as restaurants, nightclubs, and office spaces, have invested in their properties in the Cobblestone Historic District. While they have done that, Mr. Carr runs in and out of housing court as a negligent landlord and quite frankly, a fool. These surrounding establishments strongly desire, as do I, that Mr. Carr be held accountable, be put more, but more importantly, that these structures return to contributing adaptive reuses, respectful of the historical integrity they were built with. It is understood that every brick cannot be saved, but a significant portion of these buildings can be. The residents of the Fillmore District deserve better and of the, in the city of Buffalo. For over the past decade, there has been a new sense of potential in Buffalo. After decades of suburban sprawl, we have invested in our urban core, reclaimed our waterfront, and renovated and reused historic structures. Considering the longstanding and ongoing failure of the owner to address the condition of these properties, it is time to step up and protect the public, eliminate the blight, preserve the historical integrity, and enhance the economic development of the Cobblestone District. The economic development of this area benefits the public in tandem with the local historic district. The Brown administration, the Corporation Council, the Department of Permits and Inspections, myself, have collaborated on all possible, possible remedies pertaining to these structures, but Mr. Carr's resistance has led us to this point. Now well over a decade, with no resolution or attempt at progress by the owner, followed with severe neglect of these structures, the city has run out of options. Tonight, we'll conclude the process of a public hearing under the, pro the procedure law of eminent domain law and hear from the public. After the conclusion of these findings from this hearing and the environmental review by the city, this item will be up for a vote. I ask this honorable body, after taking all of this into consideration, understanding the rarity of this case and vote in the affirmative, I'm ready to hear from the public, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Mr. Montour. The next three speakers are going to be Sam Savarino, Josh Holtzman, and Christiana Limniatis. Do we have anybody on Zoom? Uh, yes, Josh okay. Holtzman's gonna be on Zoom. Okay. Hello. Yep. Just uh, state my, your name for the record. My name is Sam Savarino. Um, I am the property owner for the two properties immediate, immediately adjacent to the subject properties here, uh, as well as several other properties uh, immediately adjacent to those properties in the Cobblestone District. Um, our buildings include uh, residences, uh, businesses, entertainment facilities, there's a comedy club, there's a music club, uh, and several professional firms. 
uh, my wife and I reside uh, in the cobblestone district nearby these these properties. In addition to speaking as a, a local resident, I'm a member of the, the Cobblestone District Alliance, uh, which is a group of, of businesses in the district, some of them property owners, some of them significant employers in the district uh, who, who care about the district and have come together to lobby on its behalf. Uh, so I speak for them too. Um, they are unanimous in, in, in backing what we have to say here tonight. I'm not without sympathy for Mr. Carr. Uh, I initially invested in buildings in the district the same time he did. There was nothing there. Um, it took a lot to, to run a business or do anything there. And, you know, our neighbor was a, a, a hockey team that had different ownership, but they probably wished that we would go away so that they could uh, use our property for a parking lot. It took a lot to, to establish a business and run it down there. But the difference is uh, everybody else that went down there understood what they were up against when they went down there. It was a challenge, but it was also an historic district. And to do anything down there, you had to abide by the dictates of the city preservation board and preservation guidelines. That was implicit. That was understood. That was part of the investment. Uh, we managed, and other people did too, uh, to construct buildings there and make them work with obeying those laws. Um, and while I have sympathy for Mr. Carr, I have to say uh, I've watched this odyssey in court um, for the past 10 years. And for, for him to come in here uh, and claim that the buildings are beyond redemption, it, to, I, we don't think that that's the case, but to the extent that they are, it's because of his poor stewardship of those buildings. And to come in here and claim that he has a development that he wants to put in there that only can move forward after the demolition of buildings in there for which he's shown no ability or proof to finance and done nothing to advance. It, it strains credulity and also insults our intelligence. Um, and we fully support the city's action to find another owner for this property. Thank you. Next up is on Zoom, Josh Holtzman, followed by Christiana Limniatis and David Franzak. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Josh Holtzman. I am one of the owners of Buffalo Ironworks. Uh, I've been involved in ironworks for 10 years now. Um, and I can honestly say since my first day in the district, I have been very versed and a witness to the uh, lack of care for the entire buildings that Mr. Carr owns. And it's very unfortunate that he's let it get to this point. Um, I can't tell you how many times we explain to our patrons, our guests, our touring musicians, our staff, uh, what is going on or why nothing is happening with those buildings. Um, it's very disheartening to see that this has gone on so long. And I really urge the city and the common council and everybody involved to not fall for the smoke and mirrors that Mr. Carr has been preaching these past 10 plus years. Uh, the district means everything to me. Um, I've decided to take my entire career down there, invest everything that I have, and really just showcase the district the best that I can through Buffalo Ironworks. Uh, we've also started the Cobblestone Live Music and Arts Festival, uh, which was founded on the idea of showcasing the district in a safe, fun manner to bring people of Buffalo and the region together. Uh, unfortunately, Every single year, uh, these buildings get worse and worse, um, and it's just an absolute eyesore and an unsafe condition for our patrons and guests that are coming down. Uh, Mr. Carr has also actively fought the festival every single year, which is also very disheartening. Um, I think that as somebody that's part of this community, that's also a member of the Cobblestone Alliance, I really urge and just ask the city to do everything that they possibly can and I'm in full support of eminent domain. Um, I've witnessed the deterioration and it's, it's very sad to see. Um, I also am with Councilperson Nowakowski in saying that these buildings have a huge historic value. Uh, he went through all of those details and those are actually stories that myself, my staff, and all our guests talk about all the time. Uh, where the district itself is constantly growing and it's poised to be the entertainment district of Buffalo which means that when tourists are coming to town, this is the first area they see, and this is how they judge our city. 
And I think if there's one thing that we're proud of in Buffalo, it's our city and it's how we represent ourselves. And I personally do not think that the way that these buildings are being handled and how they look reflects a true Buffalo and what Buffalonians are all about. Um, it's again, it's just very sad. And it's something that I give my full support to the city of Buffalo as an owner, an operator, a guest, a patron, uh, and a true Buffalonian that I really hope something gets done and it gets done quickly uh, because every day that goes by, we get closer and closer to losing these historic buildings permanently. Thank you very much for your time and I appreciate everything. Okay, thank you. Next speaker. Next up is Christiana Limniatis, followed by David Franzak and Trey Thompson. Hi, I'm Christiana Limniatis from Preservation Buffalo Niagara. I am here to voice our support of the city's work to protect and preserve 110 and 118 South Park Avenue to ensure that these historic resources remain as part of our built environment into the future. 29 years ago in 1994, the city not only identified these buildings as being culturally and architecturally significant, but took the step to locally landmark them, affording them protection under the preservation ordinance. The city reaffirmed that designation in 2014 by submitting that nomination to the National Park Service to secure historic tax credits for these properties. Despite these protections, these buildings have been allowed to sit vacant and to deteriorate to the point that it has created a public safety hazard. If the current property owner is unwilling or uninterested in rehabilitating these buildings, then the city must step in to get these properties into the hands of those who are able and willing to do the necessary work. No matter the specific tool that is being used, eminent domain in this case, receiverships or other programs, Preservation Buffalo Niagara is wholly in support of the city of Buffalo holding property owners accountable for the stewardship of our historic built environment. Given the spurt of development in the Cobblestone District and nearby Canal Side, there is no reason these buildings should be sitting in ruin. There is no reason why these properties cannot be rehabilitated and become occupied tax contributing properties again. I should note that we actually just recently produced a court ordered stabilization report on these properties documenting how they are perfectly able to be rehabilitated and reused. Given their construction and building typology, these structures can be rehabilitated into any number of different civic, community, residential, or commercial uses. Uses that would positively impact the immediate neighborhood and the city as a whole. Again, if the current owner is unwilling to do that, then a new path forward must be determined. But I want to make sure that the city understands that this is not enough that we need to switch the conversation of how we enforce our building and preservation codes so that we are being proactive in our protection of our built environment. I therefore call on the mayor and Mayor Brown and Common Council to work together to create policies and procedures and new legislation to do so. We need to stop prioritizing developers' rate of returns over the needs and general wel welfare of Buffalonians. Thank you. Next speaker is David Franzek, followed by Trey Thompson and Robert Prescott. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I applaud Councilmember Novakovsky's uh, resolution to employ eminent domain on these very vital and important historic properties, of which I have a very long history. Uh, 30 years ago, there was a proposal to demolish all the buildings in the Cobblestone District to uh, construct the hockey arena. I was the council member, so I wanted to acquaint myself what's going on there. Um, I became um, educated about the vast importance of these structures and the individuals who are currently working there, including blacksmith, uh, Mr. Ed Rudnitsky, who I became very friendly with and wrote an article about, uh, people like John McHendry. Uh, I network with people like uh, Tim Tillman of the Preservation Coalition. Of course, he was the strongest ally, and uh, I uh, assisted him uh, when the uh, Belgian block, as they call it, cobblestone, but it's actually 1835, almost 190 years old Belgian block, uh, which they restored. Uh, I authored three resolutions uh, on the Cobblestone Historic District in 1993. The first was the landmarking resolution uh, that I authored, and the, this Common Council approved landmarking of the Cobblestone Historic District, understanding the critical importance. Uh, I, I sponsored a resolution that there be no demolitions in the Cobblestone Historic District um, uh, as well. 
And I also uh, sponsored the resolution that expanded the boundaries of the Cobblestone Historic District, one of the, the, the origins of Buffalo's Industrial Revolution. When you had good developers that could come in, like you heard Mr. Saverino, who came in and did things in a positive way, not let buildings deteriorate like Mr. Carr. The Common Council was an involved agency and improved an amendment of the Waterfront Urban Renewal Plan as well, designating uh, through the DEIS, which is the Environmental Impact Statement, that... Um, uh, these historic buildings should be preserved. Uh, consequent to that, the Preservation Board of the City of Buffalo voted for the landmarking of the Cobblestone Historic District. Um, uh, and that was done. In 2014, you heard that um, uh, it became a National Historic Landmark. Uh, you know, I always had the impression that Mr. Carr uh, wanted to throw these buildings down for parking. The, the old going back to the old idea of having parking in that area, which they originally wanted to do. Um, and I never believed in that uh, uh, chimera of a 55 story tower that, uh, you know, Douglas Jamal to the 10th power probably couldn't do. It wouldn't be appropriate, appropriate in that area, area anyway. Uh, I would hope that Judge Carney, I've been in housing court many times in the past with more egregious violations, and uh, the judge put people in jail for that. Uh, why this wasn't done in this case, I'll have no idea. Uh, uh, I, I would urge this council to um, uh, you know, support the eminent domain for this very important district. It can be developed, and it must be developed. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Trey Thompson on Zoom, followed by Robert Prescott and Stan Mikowski Jr. Good evening, and thank you for the time to speak. Uh, my name is Trey Thompson. I'm a resident of the Fillmore District with my spouse and two boys. I'm also a runner. I run by these properties often, and I've got concerns about their current state. As you've heard, they're ugly. Uh, there are dangerous lines of sight from the scaffolding, which has been there for many years. It makes it difficult to avoid cars and trucks as a pedestrian. Uh, the structure itself is becoming increasingly unsafe too. Uh, we heard the property owner has failed to fix glaring issues for years upon years. While the city and other developers are investing in the immediate area with the DL and W terminal, canal side improvements and others, I worry those investments are going to be wasted if these buildings stay in their current state or, or more likely deteriorate for more years. I will say I highly encourage the current owner to purchase a nearby parking lot and take the time needed to explore the Unity Tower project there. Uh, but on a more immediate timeline, after a decade in housing court, it's clear the only way for the safety issues and other concerns to be addressed quickly and the space to be finally put to good use is for the city to take control of the property. So because of that, I'm asking the council to exercise the power given to it to complete the eminent domain process as quickly as possible. Thank you. Next up is Robert Prescott, followed by Stan Mikowski Jr. and Tom Eisenman. Do we have Robert? No? Moving on, we have Stan Mikowski Jr. Do we have Stan Mikowski? No. Next up, we have Tom Eisenman. Do we have Tom? Next up, we have Paul McDonald, followed by Tim Thielman. There we go. Good evening, everyone. My name is Paul McDonald. Um, some of you know me. Um, I recently retired from City Hall. I was architect and director of facilities for the Buffalo Public Schools for 25 years, where I oversaw approximately 8 million square feet of schools, most of them masonry construction. Previous to that, I was an architect with the Department of Public Works in Buffalo for about six and a half years. Um, I was also chair of the Buffalo Preservation Board for 11 years, um, and I am currently the president of the Campaign for Greater Buffalo history, architecture, and culture, and I am incoming president for the New York State American Institute of Architects. So I think I bring some expertise to this building, and I did tour this building a year ago. In fact, it was February 1st, and I think you have my report, but I can go through it quickly. Um, I visited the reference site with representatives of the City of Buffalo Inspections and Licenses to inspect the condition of the buildings and ascertain what steps were necessary to stabilize them and prevent further deterioration. The buildings are brick structures with wood interior framing, 
The buildings have been exposed to the elements for well over a decade. Most of the windows are broken or missing and the roof shows signs of deterioration with some substantial leaks and partial collapse. That being said, the building is robustly constructed and can be stabilized and sealed from the elements. All parties at the site visit were able to traverse all floors uh, in the building without any danger. Floors are intact and appear to be in good shape. Wood columns are solid and floor and roof framing appear to be mostly intact. There is a collapsed portion in the Northeast portion that can be reframed and receive new framing, new, new roofing. Um, just because I uh, am limited in time here, I just want to say there are numerous examples of buildings that were in just as bad a shape, if not worse, that have been restored in Buffalo. The Webb building, which is next to the Pearl Street uh, pub, that had a collapsed roof and was ready to be demolished. That was renovated by Rocco Termini. Um, the uh, white livery stable down on the west side, that collapsed one, one evening and was in, I think, was that your project, Sam? Yeah, it was Sam Severino. yeah, it was Sam Severino's project, totally rebuilt. Um, we see uh, 55 Chicago Street where the resurgence brewery is totally rebuilt. And that was in, in my opinion, in worse shape. Um, these can be saved, they should be saved. And you know, as a preservationist, as an architect, and what you look for is that the, the facades in the public right of way, Illinois Street and South Park are intact. And those, are, those should be restored. And if any reconstruction needs to happen behind it, these buildings have been allowed to deteriorate. And I find it ironic that um, Daryl Carr plans to save them for the facade for the new project. Well, if he had any intention to save them, he'd be working on them right now. He'd be restoring them and preventing them from deteriorating. So I urge you to take action and uh, fully support any, any action you can take. Thank you. The final speaker we have signed up to is Tim Thielman. And then if there's anyone uh, in the room from the public that wants an opportunity that has not spoken yet as well, uh, please come to a microphone and we'll give you three minutes. Yeah, my name is Tim Thielman. I'm executive director of the Campaign for Greater Buffalo History, Architecture, and Culture. We, uh, of course, urge the Common Council uh, to uh, undertake eminent domain proceedings uh, to acquire these buildings. We applaud the Brown administration for its action. We recognize that in the history of Buffalo and uh, urban renewal days and uh, building of urban highways, eminent domain was most often used to destroy buildings. This is a case where eminent domain can be used, should be used, must be used to save and preserve and restore a building. And it is a very important building. I just passed out an illustration of a panorama of Buffalo in 1880. There's a red line on it, which describes the waterfront urban renewal district as well as an extension uh, to Michigan Avenue that encompasses Buffalo's historic waterfront. Every single building depicted in that map on the waterfront has been destroyed except for the buildings circled in green, which are the subject of this hearing today. These are very important historic structures. I hired Drs. Elizabeth Scholl and Thomas Leary to do the historic research and to create the application that the Common Council approved under Dave uh, Franzek's leadership to create the Cobblestone Historic District, the first industrial heritage historic district in this area of the state. Um, Mr. Carr, as others have mentioned, has uh, not been a good steward. He's been neglectful, as the councilman mentioned. It's uh, demolition by neglect that we're witnessing. Um, it is high time that the city and the council took action to take over this building and restore it. As Mr. McDonald mentioned, many buildings in worse condition have been restored. In fact, the Bosch building, some of us may recall, I think it was in uh, 
um, the Fillmore District, in fact, on, on Main Street, had a tree growing up from the third floor through what was the fifth floor roof. It's now been uh, long totally restored and used for housing. And again, other buildings uh, in the old First Ward, in fact, uh, have been restored. So the buildings can be restored. They are designated historic landmarks. And this would be a wonderful signal to um, the citizens of Buffalo that historic preservation is economic development. So we urge the city to take quick action and uh, commence at once with eminent domain on these buildings. Thank you. I believe that's it for speakers. I think uh, Commissioner Umder, you wanted to uh, respond to some of the comments. Thank you, Councilman. So I just wanted to share some of the city's records uh, relating to the proposed project that Mr. Carr mentioned today. Um, in May of 2016, Mr. Carr started an application with the Department of Permit and Inspection Services to erect a 60-story mixed-use building with underground parking. And uh, the next step would have been, you, you know, you come to our office, you start an application, you, you pay a fee and you go on to the zoning board if there's zoning variances required. Nothing ever progressed beyond that first day of visiting our office. And that was in 2016. In 2018, Mr. Carr came to the Department of Permit and Inspection Services and filed a permit to erect a 55-story multi-use hotel tower top of the town to include five above ground parking levels and four below ground parking levels with the renewable energy components I believe were referenced today. Uh, the $50 application fee wasn't even paid on that one. Again, perhaps in anticipation of this evening's meeting uh, on January 6th, that was Friday, uh, Mr. Carr came into our office and filed a permit to erect a 55-story multi-use tower building with uh, above and below ground parking, and the $50 application fee was not paid there. So I just offer this as evidence of perhaps a disingenuous uh, project. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Rivera. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I am um, gonna get into the legal merits of the case. That's something for the courts to decide or the integrity of the building. That's for other people to decide. Uh, and I'm gonna certainly pay close attention for whatever decisions are made, but there are things that we can decide on. And one is the preservation guidelines. Failure to act for 14 years, to me, somebody should be held accountable for that. I go to housing court a couple times a week. And it's frustrating, the delays, but 14 years of delays, something is either wrong with the system, that cases can be go, can go on for that in the for that long period of time and in between that period of time the building continues to deteriorate nothing happens for 14 years numerous attempts the one thing i do know based on what i was told by permits and inspection numerous attempts were made to stabilize to try to get them to stabilize the building nothing was done the negative impact on canal site itself the disinvestment, the property values that go down because of this building being in the condition it is in, public safety. If I am a judge, I should be held accountable as well. There's no way I can allow this to continue on my docket for 14 years. And the people that are responsible for this should be held accountable regardless of what happens in court. Regardless of what happens, if you win or lose the case, regardless, this gentleman should be held accountable. 
And I'm not just saying, I, I believe that everyone that goes into housing court that doesn't deal with the codes of the city of Buffalo should be held accountable. Nothing personal against you. Nothing at all. I don't even know you. As far as your building, your 55, 65, 70 story building, uh, it's a good idea somewhere else. If you want to do it, find a parcel of land somewhere downtown, build a, a 80 story building if you like, but pay the $50 and do something. Um, and so you come to us and you show us pictures of something that you want to build. I really don't trust that it's ever going to get built. I remember they wanted to build a building on the waterfront and council member Franzik is here and we, both him and I objected to the building. It, we knew it was never going to get built, never got built. So um, we went through all of that. The building never got built. Uh, I believe that somebody should be held accountable. I am not a proponent of, of eminent domain unless you really need to do it. And in this case, based on the information I have here, I believe they should eminent domain it. And, and I'm, I'm on the other side of this issue most of the time. If somebody else wants to develop this property and you don't feel it's worthy of, of being restored, then let them do it. Sell it to them. Do something. If you don't feel it's it's uh sta it's stable enough or it, it doesn't have the integrity to to make well step aside let somebody else do it we've seen it throughout the city of buffalo we've seen adaptive reuse in different parts of the city in my district Saverino, rocco termini there are just so many people that are doing adaptive reuse if you don't feel comfortable with this then step aside and let somebody but we can't continue in the condition we're in right now I mean, I think that's the last parcel of waterfront land that we have that can be developed right now. The Webster block was one and you had Harbor Center go in there, but this is the few remaining parcels of land where we can do something there. So I ask you, if you don't feel comfortable, step aside, let somebody else do it. Um, I wish you would step aside, tell you the truth. I wish you would just step aside and somebody that wants to step up and 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 rehab this building. Uh, um, let them do it. Let them. They have skin in the game. They're going to pay for it. Let them do it. Uh, so, based on the information that we received today, all, all the points that were made, um, I agree with them. As far as the integrity, as far as the legal merits, I don't know. That's up to the courts to decide. But as far as the failures to act for 14 years, that's on you. That's on you. Mr. Chairman, so I support Council Member Mitch Nowakowski's uh, decision or his request for the demolition or for the um, imminent domain. Thank you very much. Motion to close the public comment. Motion to close. Were you going to keep it open until Tuesday? For, for submissions. Oh, for submissions. For submissions, yeah. <laughs> Um, by the close of business Tuesday, but Mr. Bowman and then Mr. Or yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to put some comments on the record here. And um, I agree that eminent domain is a kind of extreme action, but the city, city is uh, laying out a very strong case. And uh, it's just not computing for me that we're going to have this 55 story, beautiful building one, you know, the normal courses of taking care of your property haven't been done so far. I'm kind of a frequent flyer in housing court and we do have properties that are neglected, um, but usually it's extreme circumstances where the owner's deceased and you fall into that situation where no one's able to. But I say if for 14 years, we weren't able to do the things like securing the property, clearing the trash and debris. Those are the easy things that could show that there's movement and that uh, you care about the property. It's evident for 14 years that didn't happen. So I just wanted to put comments on the record in support of my colleague. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Wyatt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just had a couple of more questions. Um, has this person paid the taxes? They paid the taxes on the property? Uh, yes, Councilman, I believe his taxes are up to date. And so they, but they haven't paid the fees. The fees I, I referenced. So when someone starts a project, if, if someone truly wants to build a project, we offer these 
pre-submission conferences. Mm -hmm. You sit around, we dig through the code. It's it's really a something that the, the city works with the developer to make sure that things are code compliant and, and we help them understand the process. To come into our office and sit down for 10 minutes, say you're gonna build a mega hotel and not pay 50 bucks and leave it is a, a farce. Mm -hmm. um, so that was the fee I was referencing. Okay, have they been paying have, is the fines? Have they paid the fines? So uh, there's housing court fines, there's old housing court cases, new housing court cases, uh, any specifics on fines you'd like, I will have our, our team summarize that for you so you can uh, understand that a little bit better and, and we give you accurate information. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm troubled by this. To take someone's property is really, really extreme. And I, I think it's almost un-American to take someone's property. But as has been laid out to us, you know, the dereliction of responsibility, you know, we see it so much in our community, even as far as, you know, um, residential homes. We see people who buy 10, 15 properties and don't take care of any of them. And they're given a pass and it ends up in housing court and they call my office and we go to court and this person still has this house. But this is a different matter. And again, you know, I, I consulted with Councilmember Franz that because he's someone I respect and I know he's honorable and cares about what he does and cares about the community and even this council and how we do our jobs because, you know, this is not something that we want to set a precedent by that we just take people's property. I mean, you know, that's not something that I would be go along with, but how things been laid out in that the decades of um, dereliction and just irresponsible to the community and even other businesses who have made an investment and they need to get a return on their investment. They went through and did some of the things that I'm sure that Mr. Carr has said that he's done and they got it done. And um, being a banker and talking to different business people when they put projects in place and they're going to do different things, they don't complain about things, they just get it done. And so if there was something, there was an impediment, um, it seems to me because the Cobblestone District has been developed and there are um, businesses there developing and doing well, I don't see how the city would not want to support you in making sure that you are part of that. So to me, it seems as though, um, our time is being wasted right now because we have someone who was, I thought, bringing something in earnest that wanted to do something, but from what the commissioner says, you come and meet and then you don't pay the, pay the fee. And then you have another conversation, you know, decades later. That's not something that we, that, that's not responsible and that's not trying to get something done. That's trying to put something off. And I don't know what your financing plans are and efforts, but it seems like everybody is here was willing to help you, but it seems again, it seems you're fixated on the city taking your property and giving it to someone else. I hope that's not the case, but I hope there's someone responsible that's going to do something with that property to continue to enhance the cobblestone district to enhance downtown, um, because that's what this is about. How do we continue to develop the downtown area for housing development, even affordable housing? Those are all opportunities. So um, I, I'm, I'm with my colleague. I will support um, his efforts because this is in his district, he knows what he wants to do in his district, and I know he's very diligent in investigating and researching, so uh, I'm going to support my colleague. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, Mr. Carr, did you want to speak? Just one comment, because Kathy uh, talked about the permit application that I submitted. Well, I was told to submit that online, and online, when you submit an application, they say they're gonna email the fees and what the fee was. There's nothing sent to me from the sixth about anything I owed for that fee. When I went in for the first, per, I mean, the permit in 2017, they didn't address a fee at that point either. I mean, I filed so many applications for projects and did engineering drawings and everything and, and paid all the fees for other projects. But this one in particular, I didn't get any email response except the one that I filed the application. I never received an email back saying paid a $50 fee because that's insane that I wouldn't pay a $50 fee for the millions of dollars I have invested in that area. 
See, nobody addresses the investment. Anybody never addressed the investment that I made initially when that was a war zone back in 1997. That was a war zone down there. We got broken into probably, and you can check the 9-11 records. You can check, you can check the records. We got broken into to a point where me, myself, and my security had to stay in there and play cards all night. So when they broke in, we can catch them. That's how that district started. And we persevered through two lockouts and through COVID. And now immediately following COVID, in fact, after that first application, I was getting together this project. And then COVID hit. We were stuck in our houses. I had two babies. And now we're coming out of all this to get this investment and to move this project forward, which will happen. You look at me like you're, I'm crazy. But you know what? Buffalo needs to move forward like every other city that I've visited in the world. We sit here spinning our wheels with old buildings. And I understand they do provide economic development. I understand this. But we need something to take us to the next level. And building another bar or another uh, concert venue isn't going to do that. It's not going to bring people here. The only pe thing that brings people here, really, to be honest, is the Sabres and the Bills. And that's from people that I know all over the nation. So nobody knows my history or what I've done, or what I've done to, because nobody ever asked. And when I talk to people, half the people aren't here anymore that I used to talk to, especially about the project. They're no longer with the city. And I did sit down with planning. And that's a whole different, that's another different planning board. So everybody's different from when I sat down. And we sat down with my architects. They were there. And we talked about, we need a height variance. And that's all we need. When he says about codes, he mentions about codes, the green code. Well, we know the new green code. In fact, this exceeds by far any of the green codes. The only thing we needed was a height variance, which when they set those codes up, it's one, well, it's one street away. The arena. I mean, I can throw a stone and hit the other, the other district, you know, the other zoning. There's always zone. So I always wanted to, from day one, to build some type of structure that would contribute and preserve the integrity of the district. Doesn't mean those buildings have to be kept there because I work outside of Philadelphia and they didn't save the buildings, but they recreated them with new brick, new foundations, and they look beautiful. And they look like they did back in 1900. I mean, that's the case that I'm looking at here. Not those existing crumbling bricks that I purchased that way the building wasn't taken care of for 60 years before I bought it. That's that's my final. Mr. You know, Mr. Chair, Mr. Wyatt, since he was looking at me, I just want to say something. He's made all these accusations and comments about what he's done, but not one time have I heard him have any interest in the people who are already invested there. I've not heard him say anything about the community. I've all only heard him talk about his dreams and not about the people who are there. And they've had to deal with what he's not done for all these years. And I'm sick and tired of people just thinking about themselves just to have money. I don't have to know if he has money or not. And again, it's not personal, but all his comments have been around his thoughts, not about working with the city, not about working with residents, not about working with other business, his thoughts. He's wanting to do something or compete with other cities. That's all well and good, but you can't forget about the people who are there. And those structures are unsafe and creates a hazard. And unfortunately, he doesn't understand that. And so again, I support my colleague and his actions and what he needs to do. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Carr, I actually thought maybe you were gonna try to redeem yourself by pulling out your checkbook and paying the $50. I think that would have helped you more than your comments. I, Mr. Nowakowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanna, in closing, just stress to the council members where this will be before is that I promise I have done my due diligence, my research, I don't would never put anything before this body that is would put anything any or anybody in jeopardy and to please uh, take deep scrutiny in this because I know that it is rare and that it is a very harsh and brazen uh, act, but there's the due diligence to back it up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the motion is going to be to close the public hearing, but uh, accepting written testimony until I believe the end of business day on January the 18th. Tuesday, January 18th. January 17th. Or 17th? Yeah, Tuesday's the 17th, I believe. Let me check my calendar. 
Uh, you know, yes. yes, you're right. I'm sorry. I was looking at the top of the calendar. Yep. Okay. Uh, the motion will be to accept the writtens until January 17th at the end of the business day, 2023. Mr. Chairman, motion to close the public hearing that all documents um, for the record be submitted by January, January 17th. Yes. By January 17th. Uh, seconded by... Uh, Mr. Nowakowski. And motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Seconded by Mr. Wyatt.